Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for it's being not, here uh, at the hey, 2020. The mic's not on. It is on. Is it? Look at that green light. Oh man. If I oh, talk man. closer, is the mic better? <laughs> Let's That's... start all that over. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the 2022 USU Art and Creative Writing Contest Award Night at Helicon West. Um, we've been away from doing this for two years, thanks to COVID. <coughs> um, so uh, I'm very excited that we're finally back and having an opportunity to uh, celebrate the, all of this winning work um, and that we could be here tonight to showcase this student work. So uh, just how about a big round of applause just to get us started. So uh, is this work, is the mic working well enough that people can hear in the back? Thanks, Wayson. Okay. Uh, if it's further away, is that at all uh, audible? Because we might jack up the uh, volume a little bit if you think. Yeah, I'm getting a nod from Wayson. Yes. Okay, because uh, this is a little uncomfortable. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's much better back here, though. I, I get that, but I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll change it in a minute. Um, so, okay, so Helicon has its uh, own warm up. And though I am not the normal Helicon host, uh, I am this evening. And as your Helicon host, I need to tell you that Helicon West is a live reading series that brings published local writers to read alongside community members in an open, uncensored forum. In order to promote the voice of every community member and democratic ideals, Helicon honors all levels of skill, ability, and craft. In addition to featuring published authors to give the literary arts more exposure in Cache Valley and its surrounding area, Helicon invites and celebrates aspiring writers from every walk of life to find and share their voices with us. Helicon is committed to inclusion, accessibility, and representation in our writing community. <laughs> USU and Helicon West operates on the territory of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation, whose people have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. We acknowledge that these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We recognize elders past and present as people who have cared for and continue to care for the land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous self-governance history, experiences, and resiliency of native people who are still here today. Right on. So I would also like to thank our sponsors for this evening, the USU English Department, Sink Hollow Literary Magazine, the Bear River Heritage Area, the Logan Library, Sugar House Review, the Utah Humanities, and our matron saint, Star Colton. All Helicon West events are recorded and posted to the Helicon West YouTube channel. Anyone who doesn't want to be recorded should say so before the reading. Uh, but, you know, it's a good thing to get your words out there. So if uh, you're on the fence, go for it. Uh, we have a very special lineup tonight featuring the winners of the 2022 USU Creative Writing and Art Contest. You'll note that this slideshow uh, running over here is our, our art winners. Um, it's going to be running this whole night. It's going to loop through. Um, this year, uh, we uh, have some really wonderful art, uh, but in general, our submissions for art were down this year. And so what we're also going to see is some of our past winning work and we tried to note that on the uh, titles there. So you might see some work that have appeared in past magazines and past contests. So check that out. Um, I'd also like to give a very special recognition tonight to Michaela Beauchamp, who's sitting right here in the front row, looking really surprised that I just said her name. <laughs> and uh, Kyler Tolman, who, Kyler, are you here? I didn't think so. Michaela and Tyler are the, uh, the staff at Sink Hollow who uh, ran the contest this year. Woo! And uh, pretty much from taking in the submissions and organizing them and making them into things, packets that the judges could deal with, 
uh, to copy editing and pretty much just running down every detail, making posters, et cetera, getting posters out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They did all the work that made this possible. So especially for all you winners out there, you wouldn't have a contest without them. So let's give it up for our contest. Um, I also want to give a big shout out to Claire Mayfield, who's, I think, hiding in the back somewhere. She's waving, but she needs to wave their arm up in the air so everyone can see it. Okay, so Claire is the person we owe to for putting together the beautiful copy of the contest issue for this semester. So um, in a second, I'll flip over to that just so you can kind of see it. Uh, but the contest issue is live on the St. Hollow website. Um, if you go to sinkhollow.org, you will get links to those things. You can see the entire magazine. You can see the whole thing laid out. It's beautiful. Claire did amazing work to do that. She also made all the posters to put up around campus and uh, on all the big screens so that we would get people to submit their work to the contest. And she also um, put together this slideshow. So as our design person, again, we couldn't have done this without Claire. So please, could we have a nice... Okay, so now uh, my blathering on is almost over. I should probably tell you at some point, uh, my name is Charles Law. I'm a professor in the English department. <laughs> I, uh, I teach fiction writing mostly, um, and I've got a bunch of students from my advanced fiction writing workshop in this uh, who have been winners tonight, so I'm super excited to have them here. But I'm also just super proud of everybody who has uh, submitted their work to this contest. And for all, of course, all of our winners, the work here is just amazing. So I'm so, so proud of all these kids. Uh, I don't know what you guys, uh, for those of you who are not writers who are in attendance, the family members and those of you, if you've ever tried to write something, it's hard enough by itself. But then when you like stack on there that we've been in the middle of this pandemic and that everything is crazy and there's a million things like eating away at our, our attention and our, um, our ability to think, let alone think creatively, the fact that these folks were able to put together work that won this contest is amazing. I am literally nothing short of a tiny little miracle. So just before we get started, one more big round of applause just for everybody. So we have, uh, we've got our undergraduate winners first, and uh, Britt, our organizer for Helicon West, we should shout out, uh, thanks for Britt too, yay Britt. Thanks Britt. Thanks Britt. All the writers, give them an amount of time to read, because if everyone had read their whole work, no one would be, would be here until tomorrow morning. Um, so we've got excerpts of all the pros, so fiction and nonfiction, it's mostly excerpts. Uh, we'll probably hear most of the poetry, um, but, our our readers have been warned to uh, follow the schedule and so on. I'm going to just announce all of the undergrads right now by name, and then I, what I'd like for you to do is just remember what order you're in, and then come up, okay? And uh, when you get up here, tell everybody your name and tell them the title of the piece that you're about to read and what place that you got, okay? So don't be shy or bashful of telling people that you got first place. Because you did. <laughs> Just say it, okay? Let us let us cheer you on, and uh, and then uh, go ahead and do your reading. And uh, yeah, that's it. So our first round, our first half is our undergraduate winners. Uh, we've got Vin McBride first, then Grace Ashby, Mason Goodrich, Basil Payne, Wayson Foy, Joe Raleigh. Hannah Lee and then Eden Borden to wrap it up. Okay, so let's give a big round of applause to all these folks. And we've got Ben McBride. Right here. My name is Ben McBride. Uh, I am not particularly young. I was supposed to graduate in 2015. You'll notice it is not 2015. Uh, <laughs> correct. 
I took first in both poetry and nonfiction. Uh, you're only going to be hearing from poetry from me because I am long winded. So this poem is quite short. Let's take this. All right, let's try that. Yep, that. Yeah. Better. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yes. All right, there we go. A short memoir of two houses. One, the house on B Road went up for sale maybe a year after he had sailed his last on the kitchen floor. It was a great old house, a true old house, the kind of old domicile that only gets sold to people who eat out soil a bit. The poverty owners, the flaws in the crafting, intolerable. Great old house. Cellar with a lifting door, hardwood floor with rocks, taxidermy mounted gaping heads, bedroom with bed on floor, great upstairs rooms with sliding doors, pine painted to oak, century turn luxury. Great old house. She learned to hate it, I think. She had to go, I know. She fled and took her brother with her and safely built a new fair lodging with great lifted ceilings, hardwood floors, space floor, a basement you can breathe in. No ghosts of the past, too young to be a haunted house. Her and uncle never spoke about life with grandpa, but his eyes twitched tight when in conversation he came up. Careful, thoughtful uncle, six four to his baby sister and a spare five four. A study in contrasts, but he watched her carefully, always, the pair of them chattering and bickering, him stooping only to hear her better. The house on B Road I last saw at the funeral. Two, the funeral is more like a party, everyone there milling around the house and talking, playing in the leaves outside, fall, and all of us in fine dress and noise on noise on noise. I carry a tiny kitten everywhere who will grow with me and die in my arms, precious and beloved. The boy cousins are using his canes to prove dexterity, holding them with both hands and leaping to bring them forward, leaping bodies for slim and quick in the brown of the milling earth leaping fences from the door of it. I slip behind the couch, listen to it all, cocooned away in safe silence. I can't find her. I don't think she wants to be found. I think she's hiding with the ducks. Three. You're just nine years away from being older than he ever got. I keep wondering if my mother looks at my grandmother, small and frail, and still suddenly living alone, and feeding her chickens at 95 at the house on 15 and O Road, the house free of haunting, and knows that she will carry on in the line of a woman without man, a person by herself, a house to herself in time. She is all sharp eyes, my mother. She is diamond, she is crystal, she is sharp glass of ice or ice. My mother is untouchable. But she watches you, close, careful, as my grandmother gets older and another house takes up a haunting. Another place you poured work into comes to the end of its life. Nine years is not so long. Nine years is barely a breath. Nine years and you will be beyond it. The man who rode the desert in mind, the same golden stone that ripped apart the world. Nine years is not so long. Four. I probably because I couldn't remember the number of times I was in that house at four. I still don't know the number you told me was right. I was born in 94 and he expired on the floor in 99 when the baby was just a year. And I know I was just past five for a few months. But, well, it was autumn. I don't even know the day on this stone. Wait, why does it matter when you got It doesn't. B road. You insist I was in that house at least twice since you went out to help on account of the fact that he wasn't one, much one for walking anymore. Given he'd had stage four cancer for nearly 10 impossible years. God give mercy, you are 67. You were a minor, even if you mind coal and not uranium. I do not know if you will bear the ripped up scars of the body devouring itself whole. Maker, I am begging that my mother does not find you on old and old. No. So, so, fear. Wonder says that no, we didn't go ever here because of disease risks. So let's assume no more than seven times I was in that house from the time before I was able to think real words 
and remember real memories. But I do have some from later. I watch them pry the frozen moments from the earth with them on his tiny old TV in that house that was all earth tones and colors. And my grandmother was in the kitchen because I could hear the sound of saucepans on stove tops. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I don't remember her voice until after he died. Five. In my dreams, I am back behind the couch with leaves in my hair and a kitten in my arms, five years old, tucked behind a couch from the 70s and listening to the adults talk. Uncle Ben and Uncle Miles and his claw seated on it while the boys eat. There are no women in this big open living dining room, for the table is set and waiting for us after the service. Alex is asleep alone. She is still so small, and so is my sister. They in the room all talk loud and fast and funny, and you are not there. Years later, I learned the word silver time. <coughs> that is them all over. Silver time. I think if I slip up the old and creaking stairs, clutching the square finial, and then pulling myself up along the spindle rails to the floating second floor, the airy breathing along with the house school, where he could not go, he could not climb. Her great uncle has his shoebox room, and my grandmother has a great spacious workspace flooded with white for her sewing. I think there I may find my diamond mother asleep with you, if you are not out feeding geese and ducks and checking on the horses. I don't know what you want to be known. Six. Someone has to hate him for the silence he left behind in all of you. I am all cold rage, a delicate mix of your smoldering forest fire and her cut diamond. So here, my father, let me hate him for you. Listen. In the new house, we had a reunion where there were clamoring sounds over and over. And do you know, not once did I hear the sound of saucepans on the stove. The house was blissful silent in the morning, just her and I, alone in the house, which was full of sunlight. And we ate on the sun porch, and we spoke little before the droves descended. In the house on 15 and 0 Road, someone teased her, my lovely grandmother, who has seen so much about the idea of remembering. I think I was the only one who saw her hand clench her jaw flicker. The only person I wouldn't want to come up against in a dark alley is her, my ice shard mother says to be full serious, even as you crack a look at fire She prevaricates, says no, says some people are only meant for the one alone. I think about that great open sun room where she does her stitching, the little flock she keeps to escape to, the vast open space where no dangers have space to work in shadowed corners, safely alone, unbothered and ghostless, treeless and sun washed in the house on 15 and nowhere. Okay. Hello. Well, by the way, in case Grace doesn't say it, like half of the work up here from this year's contest is her. So my name is Grace Ashby. I got first place in the undergraduate fiction and art sections. And um, yeah, I'm <laughs> reading an excerpt starting from page four of my story, The Book of the Stars. When my many times great grandfather, Elias Oakhart, first found the grove of coca cola trees, he gave his wife, Sarah, the planks of heartwood from the first tree he cut down. They were fairly old for the time, their children all grown and married, and she had been ill for a while. They knew they didn't have much time left together. He presented the wood to her as a symbol that she would always be his heart and home, no matter what, and asked her what she wanted him to make into it. She asked him to build a casket so that even in death, she would have the warmth of his love to accompany her. 
When she died shortly after, they didn't need a funeral wreath. The casket was covered in intricate, intricate carvings of lifelike flowers and birds. People at the time said he must have poured his own life into it because Elias died shortly after. It's been a tradition to give our heartwood to our spouse on the night of our marriage ever since. They keep the wood in the heart of our home until the day they can't, and then we bury it with them. Charlie made a small choking noise, and Cal looked over to see the young man staring wide-eyed at him. Cal chuckled before explaining, Leah thought it was weird at first, too. It's not about death. It's about love beyond death. It's a promise that we will be faithful to them for the rest of our lives and beyond. That's why we use the heartwood of the Pocobolo. We're giving our significant other our heart. Charlie scratched at his chin and mumbled, I suppose that's kind of romantic. Cal pulled out one of the half of one half of the curved casket cover of the unassembled casket free of the pile. Every piece was prepared so that it, so that it just needed to be assembled. That way he could focus on the finishing touches without running out of time. He handed the lid to Charlie. Start taking these out to the shop. It should be unlocked. Cal glanced down at the dark blue dressing gown he had pulled over his pajamas before the EMTs arrived. I need to get dressed. He had a lot of work to do. Cal stepped into, into the workshop in a well-worn pair of jeans and a t-shirt covered in stains from varnish and wood stain. Charlie was standing in the middle of the room, the pieces of the casket laid out on the main work table. The younger man was looking around the wide room, his eyes wistful as he examined the various table saws, sanders, and planers. He clapped Charlie on the shoulder. Brings back old memories, doesn't it, said Cal. I can still remember you as a scrawny lad struggling to lift uncut maple planks in the wood shop at school. Seems you've picked up the pace of your woodlugging skills since heading off to college. Are you sure you didn't sneak in some woodworking with that engineering degree that you didn't tell me about? Charlie shrugged and smiled longingly at the table saw in the left corner of the shop before he said, I wish. It's one of the few things I miss about high school. I have some handyman tools for work around the house, but Claire and I don't make enough money to buy any serious equipment right now. We have to pay off our student debt before anything else. Well, I'm sure you'll get a hold of some tools of the trade eventually, said Cal. He had a smile. Oh, Charlie would be getting more than just a few tools, and it would be a lot sooner than the young man expected. Cal was glad he had listened to Leah's suggestion about who to leave everything to when they had rewritten their will a few years ago. If there is one good thing about this situation, it was that Cal could leave knowing that he and Leah had made one young couple's life easier. Charlie glanced back and forth between Cal and pieces of casket. Can I help, he asked. Cal opened his mouth to say no, that he didn't need any more help, that he'd like to be alone to craft his grief into a final masterpiece. He paused. Cal had been there for his father when his mother died, had worked in silence beside the older man as he guided Cal through one final lesson, a lesson about life and death and accepting where one ends and the other begins. Cal didn't have a son. He didn't have anyone to pass down the stories and traditions of his family to, and a part of him ached to think that there would be nothing left behind after him. Centuries of ancestry and wisdom erased by a single man. He stared at the former, his former student. Charlie was already inheriting the house and the land. Maybe he would leave a little bit of a legend behind it all with the young man as well. All right. Assembling the box of the casket flew by as Charlie held whole boards in place and marked where the handles would go. Charlie, Cal didn't bother to hide what he was doing as he worked. The younger man didn't comment as the joints under Cal's hands melded together without glue and handles clung to their correct positions without a single screw. His wide eyes and open mouth frozen under the quiet weight of Cal showing him secrets that no one outside of his family had ever seen. There were others that knew or guessed, of course. It would be hard to get proper death certificates for the Oakharts who fell to the curse otherwise, but no one outside of the Oakhart bloodline had actually seen their magic at work before. Cal ran a hand over the sharp edges of the blocks, smoothing them out into rounded curves. There was a stiffness to his skin that hadn't been there before. Charlie's shirt felt strained underneath his fingers as he gently turned the younger man away from the work table by his shoulder and towards the door. Thank you, said Cal said. 
The eye needs to do the rest alone. The carving, it's a private process and it's getting late. Go home to your Claire. Thanks, you should go ahead and grab that mic too. Yeah. It's better if it's right says okay. Okay. Is that okay right there? Perfect. Cool. Uh, yeah, my name is Mason Goodrich, and I won uh, second place in the undergraduate poetry uh, portion section. Um, and I'll be reading two uh, poems today. The first one is titled Construction Work. And it goes like this. Like a mole on the face of the previously perfect pitch black parking lot of the perfectly pitched licorice brick church, it blemished into view kindly on an otherwise occluded day. God dropped us the pile on a good day. From Fenceport View, we emerged ready, red, eager especially to see beyond the tip of the rain ratched green steeple. But even more to borrow and brandish the dumpster's old Victorian deep crimson couch cushions as shields or sluts, where we bled gray brown instead of red. And then we used to knock when a stray rock caught up our front foot brace and ended in face plant. God washed, and I did not take his name in vain, but <laughs> still the cop car called the play. A maroon and blue beetle that ground the honey horizon to a stub of pollen, halted a new view closer and closer and closer, spread its seizure wings out, and finally blinding, perverted the asphalt with broken stained glass reflections like it had baton the chapel until it admitted what it meant to be sacrilegious. And the choir of suburban homes were the watching angels in all light during our soul dragging justice walks. After all, how can you be congealed with boredom in a place like this? The claw came the next day to put the dirt pile back where it belonged, and God was all out of quarters. Okay, and this one is uh, called Fresh Cut Distress. The apricot in the liquid sky made the air taste molasses, quite ripe. Losing breath, it drowned and browned, and the air was honey again, the moon its milky companion. The snake tongues of the front yard, green and hissing together, stretched to one side in the dirt, licked up every drop of the blueberry night, and limp heavy, left due for the lawnmower to cough on as it lost them their right to tattle on and on about the wind. Thereon, they clung to young feet and finally found themselves familiar, forgotten with the frothy, parched, dry carpet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Basil Payne. I won second place in the undergraduate nonfiction category. Woo! And I'm going to read a chunk of my piece, Chicken Coop. Sometime in the early 80s, my father, Robert, burned down a chicken coop. It was a cheap chicken coop, a homemade one, in fact, built up of cheap, scratchy plywood, rusty chicken wire, and black fruit leather rescue shingles. His father built it with his giant yet gentle hands. His intimidating stature is what people saw first. It was what his chickens always saw first. People and chickens alike would scatter when they saw him, a large lumbering man. Neither people nor chickens had anything to fear. This man cared for his chickens like he cared for his family, with all his heart. Robert's parents decided to get chickens when he was a young child. I can imagine they got them for a myriad of reasons, to save money, to be self-sufficient, and to give my grandpa some feathery little friends. <laughs> he never told me what type of chickens they had. The part of the story that always brought a smile to his face was when we started the fire. Not when he told me he had chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Frustration would bubble up in my chest when he glossed over the chickens. They were the most important part of the story. I'll just have to imagine what types of chickens his family would have had. A stripy one, a black and white one, maybe a one. 
My imagination wasn't most realistic. The most important part of the story, Robert claims, is how he set the chickens on fire. I wanted to know about the chickens and if they were safe after the fire. He conveniently left out what happened to the chickens every time they recite the story to me. The whole time I imagined them all tucked away in my bunker. I imagined that my grandparents would have a well summer. Well summer are a breed of chickens that have a wonderful list of positive attributes. One positive attribute is that they look cool. Their bodies are covered in milky brown feathers that lead into a dark color near the tail. And their heads are covered in a lovely burnt orange speck with brown, red, and white in the inner parts of their feathers. This bird is known to be very kind. They would have gotten along well with my grandfather. He could hold them and pet them to his heart's content. Maybe good news about the things he loved with them. Talk about mechanics or airplanes with them. Well, some are known to be intelligent after all. Robert loved to talk about how he burnt ants to a crisp as a child. His preferred method of killing was with a magnifying glass. He justified his righteous wrath because the ants liked to snack on the leftover chicken feet still on the dusty ground. They were taking up space. Maybe they were on the Easter egg. This type of chicken, although not a particular breed, can lay eggs in a rainbow of colors, but only if the rainbow includes blue and greens. Easter egg or chickens can't be determined by their appearance. That has nothing to do with their eating eggs. They can look like any other breed of chicken, but their eggs will always give them away. On the inside, they are fundamentally different from the others. Robert always got excited when it was time to recount the coop bursting into flames. This part had a habit of gripping onto my heart in my rib cage. After scorching a couple inks on ants, Robert accidentally set the ch bag of chicken feed on fire. He smacked it a couple times in an attempt to put the flame out, but the chicken feed tipped over onto the coop and it immediately burst into flames. Dry plywood swiftly gripped onto the fire, and tar dripped from his shingles like tears. Shingles like tears. Robert ran to his room once the fire got out of control, leaving the door to the chicken coop closed. <coughs> they could have had an ice bar. This beautiful breed of chicken is coated in silvery blue feathers. The silver and blue contrast well with fiery tones of red and orange. Red and orange would singe away silver and blue, melting a soft feather vein, leaving just the bone backbone of the rackets of the feather. Did these colors kill the chickens? If his mother only knew about the fire because she smelled smoke on his shirt. She ran outside and tried her best to put the fire out. Robert told me that his mother scolded him. But he never told me it was that good. I imagine his father would be digging out, out there digging through the rubble, looking for claws, feet, bones, anything in these little chickens. I also imagine he'd find nothing. Nothing was left. After he left, I would lay there in bed and stare up at the bed slots that were there. I'm using this to burn on my chest because I was worried about the story. Wondering why he killed the ants, why he didn't tell his parents about the fire, and why he was smiling. Someday I want chickens. The fresh eggs would be great for baking, and I could get some feathery little friends. I'll hold them, pet them, give them a happy life. Get them a fancy chicken coop with heating installed, insulated enough to keep them comfortable during the winter. Maybe be something with hatches so it could be open during the summer and they could let their feathers rest on the breeze. I'll go outside every morning and open the door to the coop, smiling all my little friends. They'd be spoiled young birds, getting fresh produce and drink for breakfast or whatever they like. A section of the yard would then stop and dedicated to them, safe from animals who hurt them. Robert and his fire would never be welcome there. <laughs> All right, how are we doing in the back? Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. I'll probably like drift down. So if you need to throw something at me, <laughs> please choose something besides the coffee. Charles will talk about that. <laughs> Hi, right, everybody. My name is Wayson Foy, and I got second place in the undergraduate fiction writing. And this is from just past the midway point of my story, Dave's Ex Machina. The next week and a half were a blur. Jack desperately tried to finish his story, writing ending after ending. But as he read over each attempt, it became obvious that all of them were just too similar to the one Kevin Carlson had come up with. The writer's block was gone now, but it was replaced by something worse. Jack had ideas, but they were not his own. He could think of nothing that did not come across as a direct ripoff of the fan fiction he had read. You are a great writer, Jack Haskell. This was a problem Jack had never encountered before. He had always been original in his writing. Professors and peers had praised him for his unique ideas in college, and his writing career stemmed from doing things no one else had before. He had never had any temptation to play off of another author. 
And yet, here he was, only able to, at best, take inspiration from the work of a nobody, and at worst, straight up plagiarize him. You are a great writer, Jack Aspel. Nightmares filled the few hours Jack allowed him to sleep each night, allowed himself to sleep each night. He saw himself delivering a large book to Ben Gaines. Gaines would throw the book back at him every night. He would laugh and grow larger. Jack would shrink and Ben would grow, towering over the author like Goliath. Deus ex machina, the giant Ben would roar with delight. Can't you tell that, you sorry ass? Deus ex machina. Your endings suck. They always suck. You hack. No, Jack would scream. I'm not a hack. I'm an author. That's what I am. Ben's evil laughed around out Jack's objections. You are a great writer, Jack Haskell. Jack said it in the mornings after the nightmares woke him up. He said it as he sat down to write. He said it in every new chapter, then every new page. He repeated it as each draft failed. He said it until great writer and Jack Haskell became the same thing. <laughs> Days passed. Jack felt his frustration grow. Almost he wanted to just write out his ending and send it in. He was sure Ben and the rest of the monsters at High Low Publishing would love it. The problem was that Kevin Carlson would be able to recognize his ending in Jack's book. It would be too easy for him to realize he had been ripped off, get a lawyer, and ruin Jack's career. No one would buy books written by a hack who stole from fan fiction writers. It all came to a head on October 27th, 2015. Jack had written days, Jack had five days before his deadline was up. Hilo wouldn't drop him, of course, but he would have to pay the advancement back out of pocket. The problem was he didn't have that much money. As he had predicted, Jack was nearly broke. Fury, furiously, Jack typed away at his keyboard. Words flew up on the page and finally, finally, he thought he had something. Squeezing the stress ball rapidly, he read through his work. <laughs> it was the same damn thing. Exactly what Kevin Carlson had written, almost to the word. <laughs> Jack snapped. He screamed the worst words he could muster and threw the stress ball with all his might. It hit a window and cracked the glass right down the middle. Jack hit his knees, tears falling from his eyes. It was over. He was spent. All of the work he'd put in, all of his early success, all of the money he'd made, every award, none of it mattered now. His mind was tearing at the seams. He was simply beat. You are a great writer, Jack Haskell. He whispered through the tears. You are a great writer, Jack Haskell. You are a great... No. No, no, I am not. Not anymore. I lied. I lied every time. And if I'm not a great writer, then I'm... What? Hours passed before Jack rose from the floor. He sat at his computer and stared at the screen. His words, Kevin Carlson's words, they sat before his eyes together, interchangeable, and an idea started to form in his mind. Pulling out his cell phone, Jack sent a text message to Kevin. He told him to stop by Jack's apartment the next day to have dinner and drinks. That would get him over there, no fanboy, no matter how talented would pass that up. But Jack didn't want dinner and drinks. He wanted Kevin in front of him. If he couldn't think of a story himself, Jack Haskell knew where to buy one from. <laughs> Cooking had never been Jack's strong suit. He was passable at best. In the modern world, however, he believed that food was too accessible to be bothered overworking oneself in cooking. Today, though, Jack decided that he would leave nothing to chance. He meant to make a deal, and it wouldn't do to allow some idiot at a restaurant to screw up his order and possibly put his guest in a bad mood. Besides, the cooking had helped Jack clear his mind. The hysterics of the night before had thankfully passed, mostly. The things that Kevin Carlson had told Jack in the bar were a bit fuzzy, because of alcohol and, to tell the truth, disinterest on Jack's part. But some things did stick out. Kevin was a part-time college student. He was back from he was from back east, and most importantly, he liked bar food. Jack's time at college, ten years in the past now, had brought Jack's failures as a cook to the forefront. That said, he had learned to make very good twice-baked potatoes. Every college student needed to know how to make bar snacks. I thank y'all. I'm Joe Rall. I took your place in the spectacle section. I have two poems, and they're pretty quick. So I'm also going to read a part two of one of the poems, but did not win anything. <laughs> 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 uh, 
This one's called Sock the Bitch. Bats is outside because he sweat through his suit. Has propped the door open with his left shoe and stands in the alley hoping to catch what the world thinks there is. He spits once onto the asphalt and stuffs his hands in his jacket's pocket. As the young boy comes out the side door from Turkey, he's talking loudly back at someone just out of sight. It startles him and the alley with yellow light and sound. The boy lights a cigarette and bats worries the rough asphalt with his soft foot. The air is warm and wet, and he closes his eyes for a minute. He leans his back against the bricks and smells the laundry smell that drifts from the door the boy keeps open as he chats and smokes. His shoulders ease down as he exhales, perhaps waits for someone to call him back inside. This one's called human. Glazy morning, pale through the eyelids, sleeping in the brush with the last of the dew. Thin wheat grass, sage, the creek is a slender thing running along the bottom of the valley. It's like a movie, like we rehearsed it. I'm waving to the tap on my chest so that when I open my eyes, the deer will have already assumed its place. And I'll put my palms over each ear just as the trigger collapses under your finger. You had a green apple before I went to sleep. I had a handful of peanuts. Now my eyes are open and the memory warps and the deer begins to double and flicker something out of touch with its own reality. It stutters and jumps, it shifts. It is a logical time, the sister strings with a droplet in her hands. It is a bison with its scope on your chest. It is all stretching and thinning like an unraveling thread. When it stops, I am hissing in a grove of aspen, new boots, blanket and stretch the meadow and the meadow after that. Sparking. When it starts again, you are kneeling and your hands are cuffed a bowl of water in them, raised above your head as if offering. And there is a woman with a tantalizing funk peering down into the bowl. Watching closely the tremors, the water makes as your muscles make the smallest of twitches, and the vibrations of the ground and air disturb your body. There will only be the emptiness of language and the warm breath of the woman pressing against your face. She'll say what you have always known, the reason you are starving, the reason you have no water, the reason your hands are cold and your house is gone is because you've been telling the wrong story. There are snakes in the creek. There is glass in your oatmeal. There are flies in the words. What if you look over the lip of the bowl of your hands? What if the water is honey? What if the bison reaches his foreleg under your neck? What if he cradles your head and bends his cumbersome head next to yours? What if he whispers in your ear? What if it is that thing you've been waiting your whole life? What would it matter if that place was not here, if it was black plastic shimmering sheen, if keyboardic sounds were glancing through the space, vectoral flashes that helmed as ghosts after they were gone, stayed imprinted on the backs of your eyelids? What could anyone say that would take you from that place? What could make you forget such elaborate workings of mind and eye and ear of breath breath and water? <laughs> Everybody, sorry. Uh, my name is Hannah Lee, and mm -hmm. okay, yep. cool. um, and I got third place in fiction. And I'm going to be reading my piece. I'll kind of start in the middle, but I won't quite make it to the end. Um, and this is inspired by the time I pulled over in Sardine Canyon this last winter and walked around on the frozen lake. It was a really beautiful experience, um, and apparently it has some of the best ice fishing in the northern U.S. I went on a huge rabbit hole, but anyway, pretty fun. <laughs> um, but uh, to kind of catch up to speed, we're going to come to an old man fishing um, on a lake in the tail end of cool winter. Um, this is called uh, Dottie Mellon, I believe is how you pronounce it. It's Swedish. Um, okay. But in the dark window to the water below, something peered back. At first, he thought it to be a broken chunk of white ice or the body of a fish floating in the water, but it was neither. It was something new. A living face looked up from the darkness. It was the face of new life, a child not older than 10 years. Terribly misplaced, but seemingly unbothered, the boy in the water looked at the old man with intent. 
fear pumped in the old man's veins. Yet he could not move, could do nothing but stare at the beautiful young face in the water, pale as death. Perhaps it was a trick of the light, he thought, only a piece of ice that resembled a face. With a shaking hand, the man took up his kerosene lamp, but the light revealed a neck beneath the ice and narrow shoulders. The harsh light reflected in the boy's pale blue eyes, making them flash like the glazed eyes of a fish, and he did not look away from the old man. The boy hovered, the ice thick on either side of him, no air slipped from his lips. In the silence, they regarded each other in the darkness. Even the ice had stopped seeing. Then the boy's face broke the surface and he was real, real as the old man's weathered hands and his aching bones. Skin soft and unblemished, he shone like the moon. No blood rose in his face to protest the cold. A head of slicked blonde hair stuck to his forehead, and he indeed had blue eyes, as blue as the ice in late spring. The old man's mind could not fight the hunger now driving him, the need that had chained him to the lake for almost a day. And for a moment, he did not see the child, but instead a living source of food. He cursed himself for it, but his hands were shaking, and his stomach felt empty as a stone. Not a fish, a child, he told himself, a child. Michael moved to remove his coat and cover the boy, but the child did not shake in the cold. He settled to a seat on the ice, his legs still submerged within the frigid water as if sitting on a dock in summer. This was no living child, surely. It was a ghost, or perhaps even the echo of a life that had never begun. A selfish part of the man wondered if the boy was the reflection of the son he had never fathered, or perhaps he was simply a boy who had belonged to an other parent a hundred years before. The beautiful boy opened his mouth, his face just as round as that moon, and the old man leaned forward to hear him. Do you know how to read the in-between? The boy asked him. He spoke in a curious way, with the voice of a child. If the old man knew the words were older than he himself was, the boy's tone echoed, echoed with the remnants of a time before the foundation of the mountains had formed, before the lake had first settled. The boy looked at him expectantly. His eyes were round and soft, but his gaze weighed more than that of the ancient man curled on a stool before him. Some deep part of Michael knew this was the voice of the day between the seasons, the place between places, the space between awake and asleep, the true patron of the lake. The old man's hand trembled as he set down his fishing reel. I do not, he told the boy evenly, his own voice hoarse from not speaking for months. The boy tilted his head in response, as if Michael had not told the truth. Then you'll be locked within him as well, the boy said simply. He did not seem disappointed. The old man looked into the boy's eyes transfixed. <clears throat> Spirit phantom or even premonition, the boy before him had known death, had seen it and clawed back to the surface. He now stood in, not in life or in death, but in some unnamed place. Michael's curiosity surpassed his fear. What is on the other side? The old man asked. He knew better than to ask the faith folk for favors or ask the spirits of the seasons as questions, but his words seemed to leave his lips before his wisdom could remind him. Aren't you the same? The boy responded freely in that same ancient young tone. And he flipped, so you can't recognize anything at all, even yourself. Pearls of water slipped down the boy's face, seemingly as tangible as the mittens on Michael's worn hands. How did you die, spirit? The man asked. Am I dead? The boy asked. He himself did not seem to know the answer, but Michael was in no position to say. After a long while, when the old man had regained his tongue, he dared to ask another question. He tried to hide the shake in his voice, the shake in his hands as he sat before this child. Why are you come to me now? You know why I have come, the boy said simply. Yes, I suppose he did. Can I stay, the old man asked. Spring will come soon, surely. I don't want to leave. What does it mean to leave, the boy asked. The old man struggled to speak. I don't want to be stuck there where you are, Michael said, trying to explain. The boy's face softened. Of the two of us, he said, I am not the one who is stuck. A splash came from the water, a sound the man had hoped to hear for hours, but now stopped his heart in his chest. A wet hand reached up in the shadows of the lake. A pale hand, a mirror of the boy's own, fastened onto the old man's calf. And a second hand shot forward, reaching for his other leg, and a third broke the surface as well. He should have known it would be the winter to take care of. Mm -hmm.
I'm a little bit kid, so waste and everything I do is for you, uh, okay. according to my director. <laughs> um, I'm Eden Borden, um, and I won third place in the nonfiction category, and my piece is called Writing in the Goddess. What I didn't know was that it was never a sin to love myself. I had long lived in the presence of a goddess who had no shrine, no patron, and no fanfare. I had long ignored her inhabitants, waiting for someone to come and awake her from the dust and rattle her bones back into existence. I forsook her. When you're bigger, no one wants to tell you. It's like a secret they don't think you're aware of, as though you haven't endured insults, being spat on, or punched in the face. Out of all my friends, I had always been the most confident. I held on to my insecure, but I held on to my insecurities like dirty little secrets. I stripped off my clothes one night, ready to get into my pajamas. As I walked across the bedroom, I turned to my mirror. And there she was, a goddess that I had tucked away in shame. But now I couldn't help but worship her. Every curve, every roll, every dimple was a reminder that she lived. The rigid cracks in her granite thighs and the many marks along her soft gold plating of her back decorated this temple. Goddess of my home, forgive me for not seeing you in your magnificent sooner. Each feature was its own masterpiece. Her skin, like silk, I trailed my fingers lightly over her statue. The gorgeous craftsmanship of her calves that must have been carved from alabaster stone, a marble rear that turned every seat into a throne, a belly mm -hmm. soft and flush as down pillows, and if prudishness might forgive my admiration, I ran my hands over the curved hair of each <coughs> cushiony breast that glistened slightly in morning light and hung like jewels upon an armored chest. These figures led up to two strong shoulders made of polished bronze. The column that held up her head was not unlike the, the ones that held up the Parthenon, all of her soft and yet all of her figure made of precious stone. Her crowning glory was the freckle upon her upper right lip. She had kissed the sun and the Sun had taken the goddess in her arms like a lover. She had laid her in a bed of grass, bathing her in warmth, and stroked her fingers up her body, turning her pale frame to gold. Despite her radiant heat, as she explored her, she shivered, knowing that the heavens were infatuated with her. Any lover after her would have to admire it and know that she had been loved by her first. How could I not have known? So blinded by the howls and clawings of hounds, I had hidden her away. It was by my own doing that this happened to her, and I was no better than them. It's a funny thing, Shane. It piles up in the chambers of your mind like dirty laundry. It sits on a chair in a corner, or maybe even a in a basket, and it's just there, living with you. And when you want to go out and have fun, you can't bring yourself to because there is just so much laundry. But today was laundry day. So I took out those piles and banished them from my face. I was so eager to exercise them from me. I shoved it out the windows, threw it out the door, tossed out every crumb of it into the fire, and bleached the carpets until at last I stood in a place I could call home, a purified space fit for my goddess. She did not come immediately, but when I heard her knock, I thrust open the door and pulled her inside. She came in further taking stock of the walls and drapes and furniture. There was an air to her going that filled everything up with light. And I find that the longer she had stayed, the brighter she glows. She has shown me the power of my womanhood. From head to toe, I have been given the gift to learn, to feed, to love, to nourish, and to give life. She taught me the beauty of a woman's blood and comforted me through its pain. In its shedding, I was proving that I was here and I was breathing and I was alive. And one day the death of old blood would bring about the new life. These natural forces found me in confidence. I am the goddess that lives in these halls. I am the force to be reckoned with. And as I stared at my own reflection that day, I smiled, noticing for the first time that I had good this <laughs> because I had found her at last. And she was free and she could not be caged again. Mm. All right, another big round of applause for all of us.
Uh, Britt, yeah. Do we have a sign up for after, or are we? Gonna it not will. Have time? It will depend on the time. So we'll yeah. just play it by ear. Okay. All right. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what I was just asking about, uh, Helicon always has an open mic portion. Uh, the whole point of it often is to have some celebrated uh, writer who has been published uh, reading alongside anyone who wants to from the audience. So uh, we may not have a lot of time, but uh, we may put someone on the spot right at the very end. We'll see. Maybe, maybe you're sitting there writing your poem right now, getting ready to read. All right, we're um, halfway through. We now have our graduate winners. Um, we've got Taylor Franson, Marie Skinner, Christopher Nicholson, Bonnie Reeder, and Maddie Thomas. So if you guys can remember that order, that's great. If you can't, look over there and I'll like nudge you. <laughs> but Taylor, nudge you, you now, nudge. Thanks for letting me go first, I have to remember. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm kind of loud. Oh. I'm kind of loud, I'm so sorry. Oh, hey nope. guys, is it good? Yep. Hi, so like you said, I'm Taylor Franson and I got first in the graduate contest. Woo! <laughs> um, I have the three poems for you. The first one is the longest and it just gets shorter as we go. So if you get the first one, you can get through the rest of it. <laughs> um, this, this first one is just called um, A List of Things That Happen to a Body. The greatest act performed on her body was her body like a mountain out of her mother's rib, a wooden beam to carry to her first blood, her first fast, yeses that should have been nose, the hand on her neck, metal bars through her ears for beauty and keys between her fingers for safety, while in dark parking lots or in elevators alone. It was her bloating skin, her chewed on hangnails, her tongue, her body fought the good fight serially, it is noble to consume and to starve, to exist without being loved by another. Lonely, her body traces constellations and dreams in pieces, clawing her way to communion. Her father said, eat of the deity's body, feel better. The greatest act of violence <coughs> ever performed on her body is how tired her mind makes it. Men who believe she needs help reaching the top shelf, mothers in love with famishing, fathers who disbelieve things too much. Her body wants to believe, to go back to the day in the hotel room where its fingers typed out, look how fat I am, I need to lose weight, and the rib that her body came out of responded. And instead of listening, her body began, became a cavern where hunger made a home and rest was not allowed. Um, well, I apologize. Um, and the second one is just called imposter syndrome. This is for my ladies out there who need to just own things. Um, <laughs> the space between a body, who the body is and who the body wants to be is a rocking chair waiting for an epiphany, cupping hands around air and knowing it is still heavy. The space between the sunrise and the sunset is an asteroid belt being stared down by a novice astronaut just trying to get home for dinner. It will be a mountain of alarm clock bed sheets because the day is not to be wasted and broken plates because the body is weak. Take pieces of glass together to find a rainbow while in a drought. The space between who the body wants to be and who the crowd sees is a velvet steel beam moving on a sweat stained mattress. A counterfeit bill did not choose its forgery. Martyrs might choose their cause, but never the bullet. The space between a body and who the body wants to be is painted piety in a framework begging to be burned down the bullet didn't choose to be a bullet, but that doesn't make it any less deadly. Mm -hmm. um, we're just gonna lighten it up. This last one's a little, it's a little cheesy, but it's cute. Um, it's just called gravity. I believe there are solar systems in our bloodstreams and that each star has a heartbeat. And the reason we keep looking to them is that deep down, we know without knowing we came from the same stuff as the stars. Iron and carbon in our blood, each breath a supernova, and with each breath, the universe breathes a little easier. Every platelet a planet, and this gravity that holds you together is the same gravity that pushes some people away. But in the end, they're in the same orbit and they'll always come back together, the same way blood cycles back to your heart and how our minds cycle back to the stars. Mm 
Skinner and I took first place in nonfiction. Ooh. This is what I make. It's an excerpt. Some summers ago, at 33 years old, and one year after the birth of my third child, I treated myself to a laparoscopic tubal ligation. <laughs> Extreme self care. <laughs> my first home birth, though difficult, was empowering. My second, more difficult, was gratifying. My third was my catabasis, my trip to the underworld. Three natural births with a total of over 60 hours of labor, and the last 15 minutes was beyond my imagination. Words of capitulation take me to the hospital. Nearly struggled free a dozen times before my son, blue and gray and smeared with bright blood, finally did. That was my analysis. The return from once there should have been none. Before surgery, my doctor, who was also my surgeon, warned me that the procedure is considered irreversible. Fine, good. That was the point. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want anyone to think that this is about my children, who are wonderful and beautiful and brave, and they smell so good that to hug them is to mainline oxytocin. <laughs> it's not about them. It's just me. My doctor warned me that sometimes people need counseling after having themselves sterilized. We both laughed a little at the idea that I might be one of those people. I was certain and she knew it. I didn't save the pamphlet she gave me. After surgery, I bought clothes and shoes exclusively from the next section. My hair was still growing out from a solidarity, solidarity buzz cut. It's mom got cancer again. But instead of the pale pink or lavender that I loved before surgery, I had to cover it with sky blue or leave it platinum. I had to. And if it had been longer, cut it. No choice. Feminine wasn't for me. My world became a ridiculous, hyper focused nightmare. I hated how I looked. I couldn't stand the idea of other people looking at me. My daughter told me that I should wear nicer clothes so I could be pretty again. And my oldest son asked me why I always wore his dad's shirts. Well, they were my shirts, and I'm not pretty even in a dress and heels. But the innocent criticism wasn't easy to dismiss. I didn't, and I still don't have regrets about the surgery. So I couldn't understand the sudden changes in how I perceived myself. I no longer felt comfortable being perceived as female. And don't get me wrong, I wasn't trying to make anyone think I was male. In my mind, I think I was rightly neither gender, but not specifically non binary. In what sane world is I wear dresses intrinsically bound to I am a fertile female? <laughs> None. The world, as insane as it has become, is not quite that insane. And I didn't think I was that crazy either. My mind was recognizing a fundamental shift in functional sex that couldn't correlate with a similar shift in gender role. I can't be not as female as before, though by some measures, I guess I am. I've come to terms with the irrationality and I've found ways to cope with it. But questions about pronouns are still aggravating because they remind me how much I don't want my gender to be part of my identity. My Zoom tag solution, rather than she, her, or they, them, I just put any, although it took me years to figure that out. After 33 years, I finally found something that was close enough to self and I that the foundations quaked when I cut it away, and I hate it. Why is my ability to reproduce more important to my sense of self than the digital parts? Why is it more important than the things that I've been passionate about and given up by force or by choice? No matter how much I've lost or how much I seem to change, I'm certain it takes more than that to alter who and what I really am. I don't know what that means, except that I am the only common thread in my life, and deep down, I've never changed. Maybe I can't change until that thread is cut. And maybe the distinction of me and not me is too rigid. Maybe those categories don't really exist at all. I've always had more questions than answers, even when I thought I had a full complement of native pairs. But maybe questions themselves aren't the center of gender or identity. Thank you.
And I'm sorry you're not done with me because I also oh. took first place in pitch down. <laughs> <laughs> this is an excerpt of two songs. And we're just going to jump right in. So hang on. <laughs> Iris was bored. She tuned out Jack's small talk and held up an unscrewed. No grease. What kind of diner was this supposed to be anyway? She set aside her disappointment, but held on to the spoon, trying to find something about it that would let her forgive it for falling short of the trope. A funhouse reflection of her face would have been nice, but scratches crisscrossed the stainless steel, brushed steel, but what had brushed it? Did this place hand wash customers flatware? Or was the surface etched by tea? She imagined hundreds, thousands of bites, bites of cake, ice cream, instant pudding masquerading as homemade. Bites so good the teeth didn't know when to stop. Toothsome bites. But they didn't serve anything that good here, so maybe it was the waitress's job to grill the dishes. The waitress made Iris think of her mother because she was nothing like the woman. And the cliche right down to the name badge, Doris. Iris imagined the piles of dishes waiting in the kitchen for a dose of yellow gloves and green scrubbers wielded by Doris. But even though Iris's mother had never washed a dish in her life, Iris still thought that probably wasn't Doris's job. It's the exception that proves the rule. Otherwise, she imagined the two were mirror opposites of one another. Iris liked the symmetry. Do you think? Jack forcefully intruded on her thoughts. Hmm, she hummed, poking at living like that. It was a rude question. Of course she thought, did he? <laughs> <laughs> How often? He slowly asked with false forced patience. What kind of questions are that? She asked, her words so lazy they almost sunk against each other. She might have apologized for being too busy thinking to listen to him, but if he was going to treat her like a child, well, now she wanted a fight, and his frustration was better than anything on the menu. Just forget it. You weren't even listening to me. Is that buzzing coming from the dessert face? I can't think straight. Meeting someplace like this was a stupid idea. Probably both would get sick too. She shrugged and glanced at the offending piece of equipment. Flickering fluorescent lights and humming fans kept most toothsome things in the diner cool and fresh. She didn't hear a buzz. It wasn't a proper greasy spoon, but she liked the place. And besides, if he thought it was stupid to be here, maybe he should learn to write his own lyrics. Do you think they have pecan pie? She asked. She wanted the most sickly sweet thing in the dessert case. She wanted to feel her teeth dissolve in the sugar just a little bit as she left her own marks on the spoon. You didn't even touch your burger, he said, exasperated. Anyway, neither of us came here to eat. You said you were here with more material. After pie, she said, you should have some too. I bet it's toothsome. Toothsome. What does that even mean? Temptingly delectable. Worth a bite, sometimes just toothy, like Little Red Riding Hood's wolf granny. <laughs> but I hope the pie isn't full of teeth. I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first mental image. Who has this toothsome anyway? She didn't point out the obvious answer, both of them because of her. And he claimed he was here for words. Toothsome was a great word. <laughs> they ordered pie and ate it in three bites that dripped the vanilla ice cream. Iris scraped each gloss off the spoon, the gritty filling like sandpaper on her enamel, the pecans popping softly between her molds. She could almost feel the sugar eating away at her teeth. The thought tickled her. This pie is eating me, she said, smiling and waiting for him to get the joke and laughing. You got that backward again, as usual, he corrected in a long suffering sigh, not getting the joke at all. It's eating you too? She prompted, hoping it was enough of a hint for him to finally get it so they could laugh together. They had to be able to laugh together, didn't they? How could his music make him feel like falling if they didn't even laugh at the same things? The moment stretched and he remained quiet. You're just too boring to notice, she snapped, when she realized that in one silent moment he had returned all the frustration she gave him. <laughs> Right here because I'm um, okay. So I'm Christopher Nicholson. Um, I got 
second place in the graduate fiction category for Do Robots Dream of Electric Horse Be Buzzer? So this, <laughs> so this story is about like a world of robots um, that are used to communicating with each other over this digital network, but then they start contracting a computer virus so they can only communicate face to face. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. I just it's pure inspiration. <laughs> um, so in this scene, um, the protagonist robot um, has lost his sense of smell, so now he's really worried and has to go get tested. <laughs> Fortunately, the nearest testing site in the Best Buy parking lot is much closer than the light bulb warehouse. Unfortunately, the line already zigzags across it several times over. Scores of units stand at attention like statues, pressed as close to each other as possible to conserve space. 4227 gets in line and waits, trying not to calculate how many light bulbs it could have inspected during the time it will spend here. Every minute or two, the units take a step forward, one at a time like a row of dominoes, not in one synchronized motion like they could if they were connected, and then stand still and silent once more. All these minds closed off to access, especially now that 4227 knows it may be infected. All these metal bodies, silent mocking reminders to each other of the connection they've all been denied for so long. After moving halfway through the line, it gets desperate enough to say hi out loud to the unit in front of it. The unit swivels its head around 180 degrees, puts 4227 in the visual sensor, and says, what? <laughs> 4227 hadn't thought this far ahead, but strange at this pale shadow of an imitation of connection. Uh, nice day, isn't it? It's pretty pleased with itself, ending with a question that will require the other unit to respond and continue the conversation. <laughs> no, the unit said, and it pulls its head back around. <laughs> Too late, 4227 realizes it's asked the wrong kind of question. But it can learn from that mistake. It swivels its own head around to address the unit behind it. Hi, it says again. Yes, we're all lonely, the other unit says, but have some pride for us, mom's sake. <laughs> 4227 <laughs> remains silent until it reaches the front of the line where the testing site has been set up. A small pavilion where unit 9462 stands next to uh, a computer terminal and a crate full of flash drives. 9462 picks one up, tries to insert it into the USB port on the back of 4227's neck, flips it over and tries again, then flips it over and feels an unpleasant angle as the driver scans the drive scans and downloads for about 30 seconds. 9462 then removes it and sticks it in the computer terminal. Hundreds of gigabytes of data flash across the screen, then freeze along the 4227 self-preservation module, which would be its heart if it had a heart. 9462 studies the screen for a moment, then says, merely mild malware. The system should be able to contain it after it runs its course. Do not connect to the network under any circumstances for two weeks. 4227 must have picked that up from another unit on the network, and while not a big deal on its own, it is an unpleasant reminder of the encryption ship's fallibility. And is it just malware? With how little they know about this virus, better safe than sorry. Can we run the test again just to make sure? 9462 makes a special effort to roll its visual sensors, but grabs another flash drive, tries to insert it into the USB port on the back of 4227's neck, flips it over and tries again, and it over and succeeds. The screen displays the same result. As much as 4227 wants to get back to work, it isn't sure how much stock to place in the accuracy of these tests. Perhaps one more time, just for total peace of mind. <laughs> I'm surprised to be in a bind. 4227 goes back to work, develops a few more symptoms like achy joints and low battery performance, and gets over them within a few days. The official quarantine makes a little practical difference since it doesn't have a good enough reason to connect during those two weeks anyway, but it feels worse, somehow adding an extra weight to the circumstances. As 4227 inspects light bulbs in silence and isolation, it passes the time by calculating the molecule ratios in the air. When that gets boring after a few hours, it shuts down most of its processing power and plays Pong against itself over and over and over and over. And over, and over, and over. Um, my name is Bonnie Reader, and um, I went in two categories. So in poetry, I took third, and in nonfiction, I took second. So I'm going to start with a poem. It's shorter, so you're going to have to bear me with a long one later. So this is called The Age of a Tree. I was taught to tell the age of a tree by counting its rings, a useful bit of information, except the trees I usually associate with are alive. Everybody knows you can no sooner ask a tree its age than you can a woman at the market. And so the subtle sleuthing begins. 
One must casually inspect the wrinkled bark, discreetly assess for fruitfulness, and look for signs of pain. A tree may fool anyone by wearing trendy leaves and blushing up with blossoms. <laughs> Don't let those details distract you. Instead, focus on the vertex. Is it sturdy enough to climb? Have little critters had time to burrow and nest? <laughs> Practice guessing as you sit in the shade at what you think is an established pillar. And don't be discouraged if your guess is centuries off. Every skill requires a little failure. Every venture is a lesson unlearned. And every disaster opens seeds for success. I heard once that it's easiest to distinguish the aged tree from the sapling when the weather gets cold. They say that the old let go of their leaves while the young cling tight. Do old trees get too weary to fight the inevitable? Or perhaps experiencing a few rings around the trunk, they <laughs> grow trust that all things in their season come back. All right. Okay, this is a, um, this story is just titled Touchy. I don't like to touch rabbits, even when they're alive. <laughs> Lingering by my visible breath is the spirit of our family pet as I crouch on my haunches at the corner of the garage. Angie isn't wrong to be upset, though her dad does not deserve the adolescent rage she delivers with each plunge of the shovel into the dirt. The time to talk reason will come later. She's not trash, Angie cried. He threw her away. She's not trash. I stretch my legs and stand back up, letting the posture of my lips and eyes remind her that Peterina has been dead for a week. <laughs> <laughs> She's not a broken toy. You can't throw her away. Did you think I wouldn't notice? Angie pauses her digging to measure the large silver gift box that she decorated with Peterina's name. In frustration, she picks up the shovel again. And I don't tell her that it needs to be wider, not deeper. <laughs> Instead, I say, you're right, hon. Inhaling, exhaling. <laughs> you're absolutely right. But dad threw her away. Catching my instinct, I don't respond. It's no use to defend my partner, who at the cringe of my nose, removed the body that everyone else had avoided all week. The most I can offer Angie is my silence. Angie stabs a rock and breaks to push aside a muddy tear from her cheek. Stepping off the concrete into the dirt, I gesture for a turn with the shovel. I think you've gone deep enough, let's just take down the edge. After ensuring that the box fits, Angie paces to the black garbage can and precariously teeters on the lip while her tiptoes slide on the ice. Finally grasping the red drawstring of the kitchen glad bag, Angie recovers her balance, hoists herself up and brings her bunny dumping it next to the box at my feet. It's Angie's turn to be silent now, and she scowls at winter and the world, but won't look at me. She turns away into the garage, and I hear the door slam on the repurposed pantry cover. Around the corner, I ask, what are you looking for, Ange? Curious if there's a plan attached to her intense rummaging. I'm looking for gloves, she reports. <laughs> oh, I say, mentally checking the bins for for um, gloves. Estimating that this might take a while, I change to a kneeling position, and involuntarily my eyes close as in prayer. Instead of platitudes, however, I scan my memory for gloves. I hear them before I see them, and they sound familiar, like morning. I was 15 and a half, Angie's age, when my cousin Michelle's twins were born. I was 15 and a half and two days when Michelle's twins passed. We visited at the end of the year, and my mom uncomfortably asked, will you tell me about the twins? I clenched my lips around my braces, questioning my mother's approach. Michelle, surprised as well, gave a long glance, gauging her sincerity. My mom nodded, steady. The first of the story I forget, but the end I cannot. Gloves, gloves, Michelle sobbed in outrage. Can you believe that, Aunt Nina? The nurse, she asked me if I wanted gloves to hold my babies. My mom let Michelle rock as she anchored her in an embrace. And then, without wincing, asked, 
Do you have any pictures? Michelle transformed her rocking into knots. Would you look at them? My eyelids lift, peeking, because the prayer isn't over. In front of me is the flexible plastic, and inside, the unknowable. I fuss out the drawstring knot and expand the opening of the bag. Relaxing my shoulders, I inaudibly chant, it's fine, it's fine. I pull the edges until Peterina is completely uncovered. And then, I look. Taking in Peter Remus dimensions, I lift the lid to the box. A smile hops from my chest as I recognize the padding in the box is the too big striped knit t-shirt that I gave Angie less than a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> I shrug. I'm always forgetting her size and guessing it wrong. Looking back towards the bunny, goosebumps move from my arms to my throat. Audibly this time, I bend my voice into the, into the garage. It's fine. Hey, inhale. So, hey, Angie, it's fine. Don't worry about gloves, hon. I can just rest her in her box. I watch my fingers cradle Peterina's head first and then her torso. Echoes of what have I done? What am I doing? Shaking me until suddenly my skittishness is suppressed by Peterina's unexpected weight and overwhelming softness. Slowly, I move her. Angie comes around the corner, and I blink, feeling the shiver of motherhood. She bends towards me, leaning in to pet her bunny. I put my arm around her shoulder on the pretense of warmth, then reverently fold her into a hug. The rest of the family huddle out in procession from the warmth of the window, and I rush inside to assemble a bouquet of lettuce. We sing, we take turns with the shovel, and we talk about Peter. Two hours later, I noticed that I haven't washed my hands. Okay, my name is Maddie Thomas, and I placed third in the graduate fiction category. Mm. Runa took a few steps toward the bed and touched the raven carp into the wood, and something her anger had kept her from appreciating on her eighth birthday came flooding back. Great grandma Amelia's last words. While the idea of reading normally sent Runa running for the woods, the mystery of the unread journals of a witch meant only for her eyes, excited her senses like nothing but adventure could. She scrambled over the top of the dusty bed to the low bookshelf that served as an end table on the other side. Dozens of journals filled the bottom shelf in every form imaginable, from huge leather-bound volumes to dollar store notebooks and a stack of note-written napkins of various sizes. Out of the bunch, Runa selected a purple spine and pulled, revealing an inspirational scripture inscribed on the butterfly-covered cover. She wiped the dust off at the end of her t-shirt, plopped down to the floor, and opened the cover of the book while holding her breath. Though nothing flew from the pages as she hoped they would, what she found inside sparked magic all the same. While she expected endless spells scrawled in hand dipped ink, what she found captivated her like simple words never could. Inside the lined pages, she found sketches that refused to follow college rule order, sprawling images of plants, animals, and clouds, along with the occasional familiar face. In all the spaces left open by sketches, she uncovered words, spiraling lists and lines covering everything from the history and folklore surrounding animals to all the known medicinal uses for every conceivable plant. It took Runa several moments to locate the spells she sought built into the fibers of the sketches themselves. Where a finch flew across the page, tiny words formed the feathers and trails of air left behind. Where a young German shepherd's ears perked, spikes of hair outlined a cure for insomnia. A focused view on a grasshopper's face showed the combination of actions that would lead to long-lasting eyesight. 
The deeper Runa spiraled into the patterns laid out in the journal, the more her hunger grew. Even without finishing the first, she pulled more journals from the shelves and began to compare. In the casual notebooks and napkins, she found what seemed to be sudden sparks of inspiration, ideas for sketches and spells alike. Consistently, she found them repeated in hardback versions with complete art and researched magic. The enticement of pattern enslaved her focus. She spent the next four hours matching rough ideas to their final forms, finding a match of some kind for every half-baked idea other than one. On an old fast food sack in bright red ink lay five simple words, a remedy for long life. Before Runa could re-examine the journals to see if she missed anything, Grandma Kathy called to her from the other room. Runa felt a flash of guilt before realizing her right to the journals. Grandma didn't seem to notice the mess on the bed and floor, barely registering her granddaughter's presence, even as she directly addressed her. <coughs> Runa, darling, your parents are here to take you home. They have something important to tell you. Her fat cheeks showed no sign of the dimples Runa believed were carved into the woman's face like stone. The cloud from her own house settled over grandma's in an instant, and Runa knew the world shifted around her, even as she closed the cover of the nearest journal and stood. All right, that's all of our winners for tonight. So everyone, one more big round of applause. We got three minutes. So uh, I thought I saw Ron here for a while. I thought maybe Ron might have a poem for us. Step down, please. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any uh, anyone else who came to read tonight who's interested in uh, reading something? We got three minutes. In that case, thank you all so much for being here tonight. <laughs> Woo! It's just amazing for us all to be in the same room celebrating this way. When it's been taken away from us for two years, we realize just how much we miss it, just how much we miss each other, how much writing's not just an individual thing, but in a, a community thing, right? It's a community event and it takes people supporting you and being encouraging and helping you along the way to make it work. And that's one of the best things about Helicon is that that's what it's all about. It's all about supporting each other and making sure people have a chance to share their voice with one another. Um, the contest, same thing. It's the whole point is to give these young people a venue so that people can see what's going on in their lives and just look at all the different things that people wrote about and uh, read from tonight. Such a range of experience, such a, an incredible range of, uh, of imagination, of creativity. Um, I was going to put it up, but it didn't work out. I'll put it up for the little bit after here. We've got the issue. The contest issue is out. It's at sinkhollow.org. Check it out. If for no other reason than to find out what happens at the end of Wason's story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, thank you all for being here tonight. There's still some refreshments back there. Please help yourself to some brownies and cookies. And again, thank you guys all for being here. <laughs> I needed to say one last thing. Helicon West is going to uh, take a little hiatus, right? This is the last one for like the next couple weeks. For a month. Yeah. yeah, for a month. So we're back May 26th at Cash Arts Thatcher Young Mansion in Logan. We're on Zoom at 7 p.m. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, check out uh, what's a good place for them to find us online. Oh, you can find us on Facebook, Helicon West, or what is it? WordPress.heliconwest.com. That's it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.